People don't like certain people from political parties because they're told not to. I'm not getting political, but I'm just saying. People are allowing their free will to be taken out of their hands and what they think and what they feel and given to somebody else. Jesus said, guard your mind. If we guard our mind, that cannot happen. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. That's right. Well, we are going to continue in our study through the book of 1 Peter. Last week, we went through the first half of chapter 1. And we learned that this book was written near or during the reign of Nero, about seven or eight years prior to him burning the city of Jerusalem to the ground and laying waste to it. So it was written in the context of that. And it was also it was written as a general letter to the Christians from Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We know that they were Christians because it says the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification by the sanctification by the Spirit. We know it was the church that they were writing this to. And they were to take this from them and they were to take it out and spread it around. Okay? And we know that we have a living hope in Jesus that there is Jesus is alive today. He was alive when he ascended and he's still alive today working on our behalf before the Father and he's continuing. Today we are going to be talking about being called to live holy. A holy life. A life that is set apart to God. That's what sanctification means and that's part of holiness. And sanctification. Sanctification, as it says in the first part of this chapter, that they are sanctified by the Spirit. Sanctification never stops. From the point that you give your heart and life to Jesus, you begin the first work of sanctification. That's the beginning work, and it continues on until you see Jesus. You are the sanctification means to be set apart to God, to live a life wholly set apart to God. And we're to do that until we see Jesus. So sanctification should be working in your heart and in your life today. Now, let's go here to chapter or verse 13 of chapter 1. It says, Therefore guard your minds, be sober, and hope to the end of the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conduct yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorant in your ignorance. But as he who is called to be holy, so be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you address the Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Con conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourning. For you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of the, of the inherited from your fathers with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of, Je of Jesus Christ that, of the, that as, a, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was ordained before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. Since your souls have been purified by obedience to the truth, through the Spirit unto the genuine brotherly love, love one another deeply and with a pure heart. For you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word 
that was preached to you. Father, anoint your word. Yes, Lord, we share it today. Help us, Lord, to understand it and, Lord, to grow in it, and grow in a grace and knowledge of you and grow in our spiritual walk with you. And, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. A call to holy living. That's not just by itself. It's not just reading the Bible. It's not just praying. It's not just listening to God and, and, and writing things down. It's not just the obedience to God. It's all of that and applying all of that to your life. See, the Christian life is a lot, of, a, a lot of application. We go to God, we pray to God, we give our praises, we give our concerns, God answers, we, we take that to heart, God tells us where we need to change, where we need to grow, where we need to do things, then we apply those things to our life to go on to be better for Him. That's the core message of a holy life. Okay? Now, he says, "Guard your minds, be sober, and hope to the ends of great to the ends to 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 the end for the grace that was be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ." What a powerful statement! Guard your minds. See, we glaze over that. Guard your mind. Not many people say that. Guard your mind. And that means, what do we think about? What do we focus on? What do we um, put in our mind that becomes part of us? When we're guarding, guarding our mind, that is that we, we guard it with the Word of God. We put the Word of God in our mind. The Word of God then then goes down to our heart and then we become more like Christ. But if the word of but if we don't guard our mind and we watch things or we listen to things or we talk about things or we we think about things and fixate on things we shouldn't those things then become from our mind to our heart and we become like those things and less like Jesus. So it says to guard your mind the Bible also says that we are to be renewed in our mind and have the mind of Christ. You can't have the mind of Christ if you're not guarding your mind. We have to guard our minds. Our minds are, have a lot to do with our way of life. In our mind we can have positive thinking or negative thinking. In our mind, we can love or we can hate. We can like or we can dislike. All in our mind. That's where it starts. In our mind. And then if we don't deal with that in our mind, it becomes part of us. We, begin, we were talking this morning about the Israelites, Israel, and how so many people are, don't like the Jewish people. Why? Where did it start? Well, if you think about it, it started way back in the Old Testament. But in 19, what was it, 41 when World War II started over there? 1941, 1942? It started with one man planting hatred into the minds of the Germans. That became a thought which became part of who they were. And that's how World War II started against the Jewish people because a thought of a heart, a, a mind thought became a heart thing and then they didn't like. They hated because one man said you should hate. Right? Choices then became, they took their own, their own free will out of their own hand and gave it to someone else. And that's what happens every single day when we don't guard our mind. We can look at our political scene, and that happens today. People don't like certain people from political parties because they're told not to. 
I'm not getting political, but I'm just saying. People are allowing their free will to be taken out of their hands and what they think and what they feel and given to somebody else. Jesus said, guard your mind. If we guard our mind, that cannot happen. If we guard our mind, that cannot happen. He says, be sober. Not talking about don't get drunk, although that's a good thing. Don't get drunk. But what he's talking about is being, uh, re, um, not being wild, not being overzealous. Be reserved, be sober in your thinking. Think things through. Don't fly off the handle. Be sober. A lot of us do that. A lot of us do that. I used to do that quite a bit. I still do sometimes. I'm telling on myself. But that happens. We're humans, right? But Peter says, be sober in your thinking. In other words, be reserved. Think it through. Be sober. Don't fly off the handle. Don't get mad. Don't get angry. But be sober. He says, and hope to the ends uh, to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are to take all of the things that we are giving other people when it comes to we are allowing them to tell us how to think and tell us how to feel when we don't guard our mind, and we says to replace all of that with hope. Replace all of that with hope. And when I say things like, when I say things like we let people tell us how to think and feel, that, that goes beyond, um, it's a broader spectrum than the today's political scene. It also can be in families. It also can be in, in relationships to where a family might say, we don't like this person because of this. And somebody might not even know that person, but because mom and dad say we don't like them, I don't like them. Okay, so we're giving away our free will and way of thinking. Okay, maybe it might be the postmaster or somebody at the grocery store or somebody back when you were a kid, their family did this to this to them and so therefore we don't like their family and therefore anybody that's in their family we don't like them doesn't matter who they are or what they've done you know we're allowing people to take away our our free will and our way of thinking and giving it over to someone else to tell us how to think and feel but Jesus says guard your mind what would Jesus do see see if we're having a mind like Christ what would Jesus do what would Jesus say to those people that somebody might say, we don't like that family because that family did this to us back in the 1900s and, and now, you know, we for generations we've hated them. Hatfields and McCoys is a good example. Okay? We don't like them because of that. What would Jesus do? Jesus would probably grab them and put them under his wing. That's what he did with the... Uh, tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and all them. They didn't like them because they were tax collectors. They didn't like the prostitutes because, oh boy, they were unclean. They are prostitutes. Who did Jesus hang around with? All of them. He didn't hang around with the ones that said, don't hang around with them. He said, I'm not hanging around with you. He went to them. He was not going to allow them to take his free will to who he want, what he wanted to think and what he wanted to feel. And therefore, we should also follow Jesus in that. That's what it means to guard your mind and have the mind of Christ. Loving the, what the society would call the unlovely. Now he says, But as he who has called you to be holy, or he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all of your conduct. Now, here's the contrast. Is it holy for you to dislike someone because of the way they are, who they are? Is it holy for us to dislike 
a, a situation that doesn't even concern us and have an opinion that doesn't concern us. Is that holy? No. That's why I, I do Facebook. We're on Facebook right now. But Facebook is a double-edged sword. There's a lot of good with it, but there's a whole lot more bad than there is good. Social media, basically their goal is to take away your free will of your way of thinking and to making it someone else's. Have you ever seen a lot of positive stuff on Facebook? No. How many of us have a Facebook account? I do. Jim and Sandy do. You guys do. You guys don't. And Amy does. How much of that is positive do you see? Not in, hardly anything. If you go on my page, you'll see positive stuff. But, it, but, any, but, but just across the board of what is on your thing when you click on it and you put your name in there, how much of that is really positive? And how much of that is people putting their ideas out there and saying, I want you to think like me? When Jesus says we're to guard our mind and have the mind of Christ. Now, should we shun those people that put those things out there? Should we unfollow them? Should we unfriend them? Should No. You know what I've done? I've actually put Christian stuff on their pages. Positive stuff on their pages to try to change that mindset. Don't delete them. Don't unfriend them. Don't unfollow them unless God tells you to. But don't allow someone to change your thinking because that's the way they think. We have to think for ourselves. Jesus said that we are to have the mind of Christ. Peter is saying, basically, think for yourself. Guard your mind. Think for yourself. Be obedient in all your conduct. Be holy in all your conduct. What do we put out there? Prior to Facebook, prior to social media, it was more of a face-to-face -face interaction. And what people saw with you was what they presumed you were like. So if somebody saw you or me, and I just got out of somewhere, and I was upset, and I was kicking a rock and kicking the walls and throwing stuff, they would think that I was this big, hot-headed jerk. That's right. And did you know, Facebook has taken this away, but did you know that in a Facebook or face to face interaction, that'll immediately affect 12 people? Did you know that? Any, any face to face interaction you have with a person, whether it be me and you, or me and Brenda, or me and Jim, or any, any one of us, that will immediately affect 12 people. Because we all at least know 12 people. At least. Every one of us at least knows 12 people. And we all have conversations, or we did have back in the 90s. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that, that will affect 12 people. That's a business principle that you learn in business school when you're marketing and when you're doing things. But it works across the board. Your attitude, the way you think about things, the way you present yourself, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you do things will immediately affect 12 people. Do you ever go to Walmart? How many people's in there, you think? I see about six every time I go there and I know. <laughs> I'm talking just people. There's always at least 75 to 100 people in there. Yeah. So if you're in a bad mood... And you're talking to somebody that you know about your bad mood. That's going to affect 12 people. That will that each person, each of the 12 people, will affect 12 more people. Each one. That's why it's so important to have a good way of thinking, a good way of presenting yourself. Because each person of the first 12, each one will affect 12. So you've got that far-reaching of your attitude having an effect on people. You see, people forget that. 
People forget that. That's how negativity or positivity goes forth. Because we affect 12 people. See, there's how many of us are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 times 12 is what? 96. So we can immediately affect from this sermon 96 people. And then those 96 people, each one of them will affect 12. So do the math on that. I'm not going to. I don't have a calculator. But think about that. Why 12? It's just, the, it's just the consensus that they did years of study of who it affects. And it's a psychological thing as well as a business principle as well as the way people conduct themselves and the way how, how in conducting themselves I mean that this person will, will have conversations. And, and a person will have a conversation about an incident on a, on a regular basis with at least 12 people. That's just what the studies have shown. So you can say 12 and be safe. So you're saying 96 people from this room will be affected by this service today. <coughs> right? Around 96. And then those 96 will each affect 12. So pushing out forward. Pushing out forward. So we need to be negative and not positive. Or positive and not negative. Excuse me. Freudian slip there. All right. So be holy, for he is holy. He says not to, he says, conduct yourselves according to your, do not conduct yourselves according to your former lusts and ignorance. Lusts don't necessarily mean sexuality. It can. But lusts can also mean if I'm angry, I'm going to stomp. If I'm angry, I'm going to talk bad about somebody. If I'm angry, I'm going to swear. If I'm angry, I'm going to turn red and just start going off on somebody. That's a lust too. That's a lust too. A lust is basically, give me what I want, when I want it, how I want it right now. That's a lust. Doesn't matter what it is. You can lust after cars. You can lust after gossip. You can lust after the opposite sex. It's give me what I want, when I want, right now. That's a lust. That's why it's called the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. Everything you see. The lust of the flesh. Everything you can feel and want. And the pride of life. I want to save my life no matter what it costs me, right? Right? So, he's saying, be holy in all that you do. Somebody gets you mad at work, don't go off on them. I had a, I had a uh, person one time, I was doing something, I was, I was redoing a wardrobe one time, and I was nailing the back onto the wardrobe. I'd taken the back off of it because it was messed up. And I was putting, I had refinished it. I'd put a new, new glass in the door, put the door back on. But before I put the door back on, I guess I put the door back on last, I had turned it over on its side, on its front, and I was putting the back on it to stabilize it. And I hit my thumb. I was getting frustrated because it wasn't going in because I was hitting... There was like, it was going in, there was side grain and then there was like a shelf. So it wasn't going in because it was two grains going two different directions. So it's harder to get a nail in there. So I'm hitting, and I got mad and I whacked and God had a sense of humor. And I missed the nail and hit my thumb. And I went, oh, praise the Lord. Because I knew I could, I, in my mind I was not thinking that, but I knew if I spoke that out, spoke out, praise the Lord, it'd be better than if I spoke out something else. And I'm saying that because I'm human. If you do something like that, not everything good's going to go through your mind. That's a way of training your mind. And the person that I was in there with, he goes, how did you do that? I said, what? He said, how did you say praise the Lord when you just busted your thumb on a hammer? I said, I could have said that or something else and I chose to say the better. But, um, but you know, God, God wants us to be holy in all of our conduct. 
And that means what we say, what we do, what we, and, and pro projecting that which is good. <coughs> projecting that which is good. Because remember, we're going to affect 96 people. 96. And he goes on and he says here, this is the crux of the message, is be holy. But then he goes on and he says, and if you address as fa if if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourning. <coughs> For you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of life inherited from your fathers with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious with the precious blood of Christ. We were not redeemed out of our vain ways of doing things. We weren't redeemed for that. We weren't redeemed. He's saying that Jesus didn't save us to live our life like we did before we got saved. He didn't save me so that I could go back to what I was doing. He didn't save you to go back to what you were doing. He saved you to be better for Christ. He's why he says, remember, you weren't saved out of the perishable, for the perishable things like silver or gold, but for the imperishable, like the blood of Jesus Christ. You were saved to be better. Jesus will save you where you're at, but he's not going to let you stay there. He expects you to get better. He expects you to grow. And being holy is that thing. Now it says that Jesus was foreordained before the creation of the world, foreordained for the creation of the world to be our sacrifice. We see that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, where, where, the, where John says that, that Jesus was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. We know that he made the decision prior to creation to be our sacrifice. Therefore, he didn't save us to continue in our sin. He saved us to be righteous and holy. Amen? Amen? So in all of your conduct, all of your life, all of your days, try your best to be holy. You're not perfect at it. No. Not one of us is. But we can try our best to be holy. We can try our best to live out what Jesus therefore calls us to be, and that is to be holy before Him. Amen? Amen? Does that make sense? So don't go off on your workmates. I think the only ones that work here in this building are Wayne and Brenda. So don't go off on your workmates. Can I come with me? No. But you got to be holy. But we, we, are, we, we need to think about everything that we, we need to think about everything that we say, we do, and we think. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's coming out of your mouth? What, that tells you what's in your heart. So when you change your, when you, when you transform your mind, you're essentially transforming your heart first. That's why it's important to understand that we should be getting into our scriptures. How many of us get in our scriptures every day? I'm going to ask this. I don't care if you raise your hand or not. How many of us get in our scriptures every day? How, 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 how many of us read the Bible every day? Right? Get into your scripture. It's the only way you're. It's the only way you're going to change your heart. Yep. No. But the verses are not enough. Well, yes, but that's not enough. You need to be getting into the Word of God, and and I I why I I say that because I don't want anyone to think that Sunday should be their week. Of study, because your Sunday should be a complement to your week of study, not your only week, not 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 your only part of study. 
Now, that's how we do it. One verse does not do it. One chapter, if you pray through that chapter and allow God to work through that chapter, one chapter can work. I personally study way more than that. Because I feel that's what I need to do. But we need to work it out in ourselves what will work for us. For you individually, for me individually. Changing the heart will change the mind. You understand? Changing the heart will change the mind. And the only way you're going to change your heart is by Jesus Christ. It's the only way. He's the only answer. So, with that being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, help us to change our hearts and change our minds. Help us, Lord, to look to you for all things. Help us to get in our word, get in our Bible, and read and learn more of you every day. Lord, I pray that your spirit be round about us this week. Bless us and minister to us and give us strength today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I have to ask a question all the time. But is Jesus the fairest of the 10,000 to your soul? Is he the one that sees you through? Is he the one that... That when you cry out, He's there, being the fairest of the 10,000. He wants to be, if He's not. But that's up to you. So, thank you for being here today. God bless you. May you have a good week. May it not be too cold that you wouldn't have to freeze too much. But God bless you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Ah. Uh...